unprecedented circumstances resulting from the global coronavirus pandemic. Governor <laughs> Charlie Baker issued an order to provide limited relief from certain provisions of the open meeting law to protect the health and safety of individuals interested in attending uh, public meetings. In keeping with the guidance provided, the commission will conduct a public meeting utilizing remote collaboration technology. If there is any technical problem with our remote connection, an alternative conference line will be noticed immediately on our website, massgaming.com, and this uh, will be recorded as well. And in order to get started, I guess we need to take a roll call. Mary, would you uh, run um, through? Well, please? why don't we turn it over to the chair, and is, he can ask you. Me? Why don't we turn it over Mary? to the chair, and we can do the roll call. <clears throat> Mary, I think that uh, we were also going to introduce Chair Judd Stein uh, just to, to the group, and she did want to say hello. I'm not sure if she yes. came to the whole meeting, but she wanted to say hi and just introduce herself because she is somewhat new to this commission. Okay, sure. so Joe, okay, we'll introduce Kathy Judd Stein, our, the chair of the Mass Gaming Commission, and then we'll go to Rick Carviello and we'll do the roll call after that. Perfect. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting me uh, pop in here briefly. I, first off, I understand we may be almost neighbors. I, I live in Winchester, right on the Medford line. Oh, okay. So, um, But anyway, thank you. I wanted to uh, pop in briefly to thank all of you uh, for your service and commitment, and I will bow out, uh, excuse my disturbance. Um, <clears throat> I've come to appreciate in the last year and a half in my role, the, the really the vital role that each of you um, our filling is contemplated by the legislature in the Expanded Gaming Act. You know, lending your local voices today, showing up for these meetings, really assists us in mitigating the impacts across the region and in your individual communities. I've learned through John's good work and now Joe and, and always Mary, right, um, this common thread, that your participation really forms the found, very foundation for the extend extensive process that goes into the awarding of the community mitigation grants and for that i just wanted to take the opportunity to today and, and express my gratitude and to wish you and in yours as well thank you thank you and it's been, it's nice to see your faces i wish it were in person um, <laughs> so um, i'm looking at the names and, and faces and, and hope that uh, the personal meeting is, is sooner than later but I thank you and, and, uh, and Mr. Chairman. The thank roll call you. vote is for the purposes of the process so that everybody knows that you're in fact um, a quorum. So good luck, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Kathy. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, so Rick, if you can just do a roll call of the people that you see on the members okay, and if, see, if the members uh, can just respond here. Okay, so uh, the call the roll will be uh, Paul Sheehan. Here. Uh, Karen Wells. He's on mute. It's okay. Sorry, I'm on mute. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Bancroft. <laughs> here. John DePriest. Here. Uh, Ron Hogan. Here. Uh, Bruce Stebbins. Here. Todd Gross. Here. Myra uh, <laughs> Negron. Here. Uh, Vin, Vin Panzini. Here. Uh, Jackie Crum. Oops, I'm here. Thank you. Uh, who else do I get? Tanya Perez. Hello, I'm here. Dick Lennon, Derek Lennon. I'm here. And Justin Sterrett. Here. And uh, yeah. let's see, uh, Enrique Zoinga. Here. Eric Barasa. And I, did I miss anybody? No, I don't think so. I okay. Think that's it. Okay, uh, motion to accept the minutes from the November 9th, 19, 2019 meeting. So I'll make a motion, we accept okay. those minutes. Second, that motion is seconded. All in favor? Aye. 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 Passes. Okay, we have an um, update on the ethics course and compliance. Uh, from uh, Todd Grossman, Todd, do you wanna uh, take over? 
Sure, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, my name is uh, Todd Grossman. I'm the General Counsel of the Gaming Commission. It's nice to be here. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Um, and uh, the fact that I do see so many familiar faces means that many of you could probably offer the training that I'm about to offer you uh, here. But uh, we do think it's important uh, to offer uh, some thoughts and comments on the provisions of the state conflict of interest law to all of the subcommittees. And in fact, we offer ethics training to all of the uh, full-time employees of the Gaming Commission on an annual basis. It's just helpful to make sure that everyone uh, is always mindful of some of these uh, tricky provisions of the conflict of interest law as you navigate uh, through your role here on the, the subcommittee. So I'm not gonna give you a, a full blown uh, overview, but we'll just hit some of what I think are the high uh, points of the conflict of interest law as it applies to subcommittee members like yourselves. Um, and if it's okay, I'll, I'll share my screen here with you all so you can see this PowerPoint. I welcome um, anyone to please pause me and ask any questions uh, that may be on your mind. I won't be able to see everyone. So uh, please feel free to chime in at any point. And here we go. All right, so first, as you'll all recall, um, the, this is a subcommittee that's created under Chapter 23K, it's Section 68, it, which makes this a state agency under the state conflict of interest law and all of the members, meaning you all, our state employees for purposes of the state conflict of interest law. Um, a municipal employee- um, uh, Todd, we're, we're not seeing, or at least I'm not seeing your document. No, you're not, okay. Let me try that again. How about now? Yeah, there we go. Okay, much better. See, I, for the first time, I didn't ask if everyone could see my document because I just assumed, and that was the one time you couldn't see my document. Um, so again, that makes all of the committee members uh, state employees. And because of the amount of time you spend on the subcommittee, the limited amount of time, you are considered special state employees under the conflict of interest law. What all of this means is that on an uh, every two year basis, you are required to fill out the online, uh, to complete the online state conflict of interest law training. Um, and when you complete it, as many of you know, uh, you do get a certificate that you can print out. Uh, we have on here to send it to Shar Bedard, but I will uh, suggest we all send it to uh, Tanya Perez, who you heard from a little earlier. She um, is the uh, assistant with um, the commission who uh, helps us with uh, the oversight of the subcommittee. So if you can send your certificate when completed uh, to Tanya, that would be excellent. Um, if we haven't already sent it out, we can send out a link um, to the online training to each of the committee members so you have it. Um, and feel free, of course, to ask uh, any questions along the way uh, to me if I can be of any assistance with that. If you've done the municipal, if you're a municipal employee and you've already done that training, you do still have to do the state conflict of interest law training. There are some differences between the provisions of the state uh, conflict of interest laws and the municipal conflict of interest law. So as you'll all recall, um, if you've been uh, exposed to the conflict of interest law before, there are essentially two forms of conflicts of interest. There are financial conflicts, and then there are the so-called appearance conflicts. The financial conflicts are ones that uh, say that as a special state employee, you may not participate in a particular matter that may affect your financial interest or that of an immediate family member or a business organization that you're affiliated with. And so it's important to highlight a couple of these terms. The first is the particular matter piece. And that means there has to be a specific situation that has arisen uh, that you are involved with. It can't be a remote or speculative type uh, circumstance that is of concern. It has to be a specific uh, situation, a particular matter. And in the case of these subcommittees, uh, discussions about mitigation and mitigation uh, related to 
the casinos and the community mitigation fund are considered the particular matters. So if you're um, in any way dealing with um, community mitigation related to the casinos or community mitigation funds in your day job, then you could have a, a conflict. Now, it also, there also has to be a financial interest involved, obviously meaning that there is money involved one way or the other. And it could be a positive financial interest or it could be a negative financial interest. It doesn't matter as long as there is money um, in, involved in a particular decision or a, someone's financial position could be affected by a particular decision. And it has to involve either you or an immediate family member, so your spouse or your children or your parents, um, or a business organization that you're affiliated with. And certainly if you're in the private sector, your business organization is, is pretty clear. If you're a casino representative, it's certainly the casino. But in many instances, um, it's also been considered a municipality. So if um, if you represent a municipality, you need to be mindful that any decision you make that may affect the financial interests of that municipality uh, could trigger the state conflict of interest law, which is why if you were to happen in this particular setting to discuss a specific application for funds that has been submitted by your municipality, there would be a conflict if you were to continue to sit on the subcommittee to talk about that application because there would be a financial interest uh, that your uh, business organization, your city or town uh, would experience if you were to discuss that particular matter. So those are financial conflicts of interest and the other type of conflicts are what are colloquially referred to as the appearance of a conflict of interest, though the term appearance doesn't actually appear in the statute. They're typically uh, looked at as situations where a reasonable person looking from the outside in might conclude that you might act with bias in your job, meaning in the performance of your duties here as a member of this subcommittee. The Commonwealth and the, the Commission expect and the law anticipates that you will perform um, on this subcommittee without any bias uh, towards any individual or towards any particular organization other than uh, this subcommittee and the commission and the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So if someone looking from the outside in has a reason, a valid reason to suspect that there is some outside uh, interest that you may have that could cause you to change your opinion, then you need to typically disclose that. And what the law generally says that if you disclose an appearance, meaning a situation that looks like um, a reasonable person could conclude that you might perform your job with bias and you disclose it, then the law says that one cannot reasonably conclude that you're performing your job in such a way. And that, of course, assumes that there's no financial component. So it's not a financial conflict of interest. So disclosing of things is always a good way to deal with appearances of conflict. There are gift provisions that you're likely familiar with. Um, the law says that you may not accept gifts and gratuities of substantial value, which the Ethics Commission has defined as $50 or more, that are given to you for or because of official acts performed or to be performed or given because of your official position. Uh, the, under the Enhanced Code of Ethics, which the Gaming Commission has put in place, which applies to all Gaming Commission employees, the Commission has said that uh, employees can't accept any gifts, regardless of value. Um, so in your case, you can, in theory, accept a gift of up to $50, though you need to be very mindful um, of doing so. And there are other provisions of the law that may counsel against doing so. And one of those provisions is the next thing on this slide, which is an unwarranted privilege which provides that you can't use or attempt to use your official uh, position here on the subcommittee to secure for yourself or others unwarranted privileges or exemptions, which are not available to members of the general public. So if you were to accept a gift um, that's given to you because of your position here on the subcommittee, then that would in, could in theory be an unwarranted privilege, even if it's less than $50. So you need to be very careful about things uh, like that. 
typically an unwarranted privilege. The, the best example that always comes up is uh, for individuals who get pulled over by the police who say, hey, do you know who I am? That's the classic unwarranted privilege if you attempt to use your government position to get out of a ticket or some other type of accusation or allegation. That is an unwarranted privilege and it is uh, illegal under the conflict of interest. The provisions of the state conflict of interest law that are the uh, most nuanced and often difficult um, to navigate, but often the most applicable to individuals who serve on these subcommittees are the divided loyalty section of the conflict of interest law. They're found in chapter 200, uh, 268A, section four. There are two main provisions that you should be aware of, and I know many of you already are uh, very familiar with. Uh, but we'll run through them real quick. Uh, paragraph A talks about employees uh, not being allowed to directly or indirectly receive or request compensation from anyone other than the Commonwealth or a state agency in relation to any particular matter in which the Commonwealth or state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. As that applies to your role here on the subcommittee, that means that if in your day job, you are compensated by a city or town or other uh, business entity to handle matters that relate to uh, mitigation or use of community mitigation funds or submission of a community mitigation fund application, you would run afoul of this position, uh, provision. That is, if you are being compensated. If you're in a voluntary position with a city or town or other business organization, you would not run afoul of this provision because you're not being compensated. Um, so it's something to be mindful of if in your day job you are paid to deal with anything that relates to the same subject matter you're talking about here as a member of the subcommittee. A similar prohibition is found in paragraph C of section four, which says that no state employee shall act as an agent or attorney for anyone in connection with a particular matter in which the Commonwealth or a state agency is a party or has a direct and substantial interest. And it has been determined that the Commission and the Commonwealth do have a direct and substantial interest in community mitigation and the use of community mitigation funds. So here the provision says you can't act as an agent or attorney for anyone other than the Commission or the subcommittee. When it comes to being an agent, that includes things uh, like communicating with someone like Joe or Mary or Tanya or me on behalf of a city or town or a, uh, a private entity or filling out an application and submitting it uh, to the commission for uh, a request for funds or anything like that. You can't act as an agent on behalf of someone other than this committee um, in relation to community mitigation related matters. And if any of you happen to be attorneys, you similarly can't act as an attorney and offer legal advice to uh, a municipality or a private interest in relation to the use of community mitigation funds or the application for community mitigation funds or community mitigation, um, unless you're talking about it as a member of this subcommittee. So those are the three areas. There's the receipt of compensation, acting as an agent, acting as an attorney uh, for anyone other this, than this committee as it pertains to community mitigation matters that should raise your antenna as to a possible conflict of interest if you find yourself in those, one of those situations. The State Ethics Commission has broken it down uh, into bite-sized pieces for us to try to digest a little better and they're set out on this particular slide in this fashion. And it, it falls into the following bullet points. If you're a paid municipal employee, you may not do any paid work for the municipality relating to matters before this subcommittee. If you're an unpaid municipal employee, you may do unpaid work for a municipality relating to matters before this subcommittee. That would apply to someone who perhaps is an uncompensated member of a municipal board or commission or something of that sort. And whether you're paid or unpaid municipal employee, you can't act as an attorney for the municipality or communicate on behalf of the municipality 
with the subcommittee or with other state agencies with regard to matters uh, before this subcommittee. That is matters related to community mitigation, essentially. It's important to note though, that if you are a municipal employee whose responsibilities do not relate to the impact of gaming on the community or anything related to that, it's unlikely that you'll face any issues under section four by serving on this committee. There's a, a few quick examples that we'll run through and then um, I'll, I'll conclude and open it up to any questions. Um, example number one, a subcommittee member and it may not work as a paid municipal employee to prepare a community mitigation fund application requesting funds nor work on municipal activities that are funded by an award from the community mitigation fund. So after your city or town receives money, you can't then work to make sure that the funds are, are put to good use or used in accordance with the application. Secondly, a member of the subcommittee may work as an unpaid municipal employee to prepare a community mitigation fund application or may work on activities that are funded by an award but can't sign the application and may not communicate, meaning it can't serve as an agent on behalf of a city or town with this subcommittee or with other state agencies about this mitigation work that you do here as a member of the subcommittee. A subcommittee member may not offer legal advice to a city or town in relation to an application or award, whether you're paid or unpaid by that city or town. And finally, uh, Section 17 applies to uh, municipal employees and it essentially says that subcommittee members can't act as an agent of the subcommittee in communicating with the municipality, meaning you can't go back to your municipality and offer specific advice based upon your uh, role here as a subcommittee member. Though there are exceptions to that, for example, if the municipality designates you as a special municipal employee, you can do uh, things of that nature. So again, um, as I say every time I, I present this, and you've probably heard me say before, um, the intent here is not to make you an expert in the state conflict of interest law. Uh, no one can certainly get to that point, uh, but just to recognize when you may be faced with an issue under the state conflict of interest law, I certainly welcome you to contact me or any member of our legal staff here at the commission. Certainly you could communicate with any uh, city solicitor, town council, or other legal counsel you have, including with the State Ethics Commission who offers advice uh, via an attorney of the day service. Uh, they offer free of charge and confidential to people who call all great resources. And I certainly encourage you uh, to make use of any or all of those if any of these issues uh, should arise. So I'm happy to take any questions. If you have any um, general questions, this is a, a good uh, forum to discuss them. If you have specific questions related to yourself or your situation, um, I'm happy to take them offline as well. Um, so we can open it up and then if, if there's uh, nothing else, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Mr. Chair, um, and uh, to Joe. Uh, does anyone have any questions for Todd? I don't see anybody's hand up. Any questions? Okay, hearing and seeing none. Todd, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, uh, next. Discussion of the 2021 Community Mitigation Fund Policy Questions. Joe Delaney. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, good to see you all. Um, and just before I dive right into the, the document, um, you know, this was my first year uh, leading the process of the Community Mitigation Fund, which I've been obviously been involved with for a number of years. But uh, with John departing, um, I've taken over that role and also have taken over the role of, of the primary person coordinating these uh, local community mitigation advisory committees and so on. Um, so it was certainly quite a challenge to try to do this uh, remotely and with, uh, you know, being new in the role, but I think all in all things went pretty successfully. Uh, we got our grants out by the end of June, or I should say we, we made the initial awards by the end of June and we've been getting all the grant documents out uh, in between. But of course, one of the, the things that we learned uh, in that process, some a few questions came up and uh, 
that we're going that we're looking for some input from this group and um, you know we sent the the draft document out to you folks I think on Monday uh, and I'm sure you've all had plenty of time to delve completely into that nine page memo and and memorize every word but um, what I thought I would try to do here is what you'll see is when we go through this a lot of these are questions that sort of come up every year and I think are somewhat um, you know the answer is is sort of self-explanatory but what um, I would like to do is walk through and sort of highlight some of the the, the key pieces um, where we would really like some input from from you folks and you know obviously if you have input today that would be great but as I said I'm sure you haven't all had a chance to read through this and I'd like to hit some highlights. You know, we had our Region B meeting yesterday and we wound up not getting a quorum. So all I was able to do was listen to myself talk. And it would be nice if uh, some of you folks had some input uh, while we're going through this. Um, so I'm gonna share my screen here um, with the policy questions. This is the same uh, document that, that you folks received. Uh, I believe on Monday, I'll blow this up a little bit so everyone can see, I think. Um, and so I'll go through these one by one and many of them I'll just uh, gloss over pretty quickly. Um, item number one, should the commission place an overall limit on grants for the 2021 CMF? I think this is something that, you know, the, the obvious answer to this question is yes, we only have a certain amount of money to give out. So we certainly need to put a limit on that. But what you'll see here is just in our 2020 result, we authorized 11.5 million in spending out of the 2020 community mitigation fund. And we only issued about 6.7 million in new grant funding. And that was due to several reasons. Um, one is, uh, you know, in the Western region, we didn't receive uh, enough grant applications to total the 5 million that was set aside for the Western region. Um, COVID-19 caused us to modify several of the grant applications, specifically the workforce grants. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, and also we had, uh, you know, frankly, some applications that really uh, didn't make the justification of the connection to a casino or that their project would really address a casino impact. And so we really, you know, based on the guidelines, we really couldn't award some of these, uh, these grants. You know, on most of them, we thought, geez, we love the idea of the grants, but you know, we can't just give out money without having that uh, nexus to the casino. So item number two is, should the commission continue to place a per grant limit for the 2021 CMF awards? And I think we are suggesting that we should limit the maximum amount of grants and you can see here, these are the numbers for 2020. And I guess I would ask for folks to take a look at that and see if in fact they think that's appropriate. We do talk a little bit about the transportation construction projects uh, a little bit later. Um, you know, we had some fairly large applications and we need to see whether or not we wanna keep that number the same or, or revise it. Um, so then the third one, um, this is, uh, you know, should the commission continue to place a limit on grants in each gaming region based on the projected tax revenues generated by the community mitigation fund for that region? Um, so we've done that in the last couple of years. Basically, money generated in region A stays in region A. Money generated in region B stays in region B. And then we set aside a little bit of money for the category two facility in, in Plain Ridge, um, in Plainville, excuse me. And, uh, you know, I think that's, you know, that's one of those things, these items that we still certainly want input from the regional folks on. Um, it had seemed to have been the consensus in years past from both Region A and Region B that we should continue to do that. And in here under the 2020 results, this is essentially verbatim from our guidelines last year that talks about how we would split up the funds how unused funds would be rolled over from year to year. And then after three years, uh, funds shall be allocated back into a general fund. And I don't think we're proposing to make any changes to that. We're only sort of in our third year of the process. So 
Um, I think it certainly makes sense to uh, keep that, um, you know, the same as it is until we at least get through that three year period and see where things stand. Uh, just backing up a little bit, I did do, uh, and I'm gonna just really call this a back of the envelope calculation because, you know, with COVID, we went three months without generating any revenues. We just reopened the casinos. Uh, the numbers for the casinos, at least in my perspective, for August, I mean, they're running at about 80% of the pre-COVID numbers for gaming revenues, which um, that surprised me. I didn't expect it to be that high. Uh, will that may remain the same for the rest of this calendar year? We don't really know. So we're gonna keep refining the, these numbers as we go along, but my initial indication is that we'll have about $8 million available for Region A and $5 million available for Region B. Um, so this takes the money that was rolled over from last year, plus what we expect to have generated uh, in 2020 for revenue. So I guess while we were going through this and the casinos were closed and we didn't know when they were going to be reopened, um, you know, we were very concerned that revenues might be way, way down from where they were. But, you know, the numbers are surprisingly, to me at least, better than, than, than we kind of expected. Okay, number four, this is dealing with workforce grants. So we've done workforce grants for the last several years. Um, we've been sort of targeting about, last year we had 700,000 proposed, sort of 350 for the East, 350 for the West, and we did get applications for that. But once, once the casinos closed down, um, which was after we had received applications, you know, we realize that, you know, especially culinary, hospitality, those kinds of things, um, not just at the casinos, but all over the Commonwealth, you know, restaurants were closed, hotels were closed, and that um, essentially there's sort of a, you know, glut of employees in these areas. And these um, grants really need to be tailored to an impact from the casino. So while we were going through this process, we essentially said that, um, you know, we can, we can continue the adult basic education classes because look, everyone who works at a casino needs to have a, a high school diploma or a, an equivalency. So uh, we agreed that we could keep that portion of the program. And what we ended up doing was the Region A, they asked for 350 and got 172. Region B asked for 350 and they got 199 um, because essentially we had to cut out those sort of hospitality and culinary related uh, pieces of them. So I guess the, the real question that we have for you folks is uh, how we would love to get your opinion on how we should proceed this year. Um, you know, the casinos are now back open, but um, you know, they're not open, certainly like the restaurants and other things aren't open at full strength. You know, MGM has not opened their hotel at all. Encore has just opened it on uh, limited days of the week. So, you know, they're not up to full staff. Um, so again, we'd really love you to think about that and, and let us know what your thoughts are one in that area. On that. One, one comment on that? Sure. It's just a, a rhetorical question. Should we uh, consider any responsibility to be training the many people that were displaced by the casino industry and may not come back. You know, who um, farmer employee and, and uh, farmer employment levels. Should we? Could some of this money uh, still be used because essentially they've been uh, Im impacted by the casino layoffs? As sort of a like the idea of a retraining for. Uh, those folks whose jobs may, might never come back, right? Certainly, you know, I think I think that's a, that's certainly a very worthwhile um, approach to look at. Again, so I guess you know we have to be careful. Again, you know, COVID nineteen caused this impact, and not really the casinos caused the impact. So we have to address a casino impact. Now, obviously those people who worked at the casino are severely impacted. So, but I think that's, that's definitely a way to look at things and maybe we can, you know, we'll talk with, uh, with Jill Griffin and others to maybe think about that. I think that's a great idea. Okay. 
Yeah, you know. Joe, if I can just jump in for a second. Um, it's an interesting question that you raise. Um, Jill and I were actually on a call a little while ago with some of our state uh, training counterparts, and obviously the what they're seeing on unemployment numbers is that uh, you know the hospitality sector has really been hit the hardest in terms of folks that are uh, unemployed. Um, and uh, I know that they're pursuing some federal money to to maybe help out, uh, like fifteen billion dollars, I think, in federal money to uh, support folks who have everybody, all professions across the board who have been laid off. Um, so you know, we asked them to kind of stay in touch with us and let us know what they were doing, especially as it impacts uh, folks who were in gaming or any other type of hospitality job. But it's a good point, good question to raise. Okay, so uh, number five, uh, this was, this deals with our, our construction projects uh, that was which we had for the first time last year. Um, so our guidelines allowed our target was three million dollars statewide, with no project receiving more than one million dollars. And you'll see from our 2020 results, we got over six and a quarter million in applications. Uh, we did actually go over our target by a little bit because it was we wanted to make sure that we got all of the projects that we felt were really uh, important. So we went a little bit over that. So given the amount of demand, I think the question that we have is, you know, do we want to? And also considering it looks like we might even have an increase in amount of money available in Region A, do we want to maybe raise that three million dollar target? I think the the million in one case we did go over the million dollars. Um, uh, and we'll talk about that a little bit, but um, I think the million's probably an okay target. Um, th these are all waivable, of course, so if there's a really uh, compelling reason to go over that, we can. But given the amount of demand, maybe we want to think about increasing that uh, construction project uh, money. And so this also, and this is a question, we raised this last year when we created the construction project uh, category. Um, but we didn't really act on it. So should the commission cap the percentage of construction costs that the community mitigation fund uh, will fund? Uh, so our guidelines really said that we expected our funds to be only a piece of the costs and that there'd be other federal, state, or local, or other funding available to pay uh, for the rest of the costs. Now, we, by design, I think, we, I think I raised it last year saying maybe we should put a cap on this. And I think this group particularly um, said, no, no, let's leave it because you never know. There could be a project that's really 100% caused by the casino. And, and um, so, so we did, we just, we left it at that. And as we got our applications in, the local match ranged from about 90% down to 0%. So we actually had two projects that proposed no local match at all. 100% community mitigation fund funds, and um, you know, and they were rather far afield from the casino. And while they did demonstrate that there was some casino impact, um, the review team didn't really think that those that the mitigation funds should be paying 100% of these costs. So anyway, we had we had a little bit of a difficult time with this because there was sort of no cap on it. Um, and in fact, we did, we funded five of the projects and actually in two of the cases, we reduced the funding on the project to better align with the mitigation of casino impacts. You know, again, every one of these projects, there was a fairly, you know, there was a good sized benefit to the community over and above the impact of the casino. So yeah, you're solving a casino impact or, or helping a casino impact but you're really providing a tremendous benefit for the community. So the way that we did this, you know, there were none of these projects where we said really 100% of this should be paid by the, the mitigation fund. So the highest percentage we went was about one third of the project cost. I think that was a project out in West Springfield. Um, you know, the, the, one of the examples that we have was, um, uh, John, your, your project in, um, in Chelsea, uh, the Beecham Street, William Street corridor, you know, I think in the end that was maybe about 15 or 20 percent of the project cost was funded by community mitigation fund with a huge, you know, portion from a federal grant and local funds and so on. 
And that was kind of the idea that we had that, yes, this is solving a, a casino related impact, but there's usually a, a pretty large impact. So the question I guess that we have for you guys is, do you think we should put a cap? And if you do think we should put a cap, what do you think it should be? And again, all of these things, like everything we do with the commission would be, would be waivable if there was, you know, really justification for it. My, my, um, concern, my concern on that one, and it um, is if you're relying on other funds, uh, on other grants, the timing may not co be uh, coincidental on all of them. For example, if I'm going to look for mass dot funds and I have to get on the tip, I'm looking five to six years in the future to get on the tip. It just so happened on the Chelsea one that they, they work together, but that's not going to be the case all the time. Right, right. Okay, so under item seven, uh, this is sort of a holdover from last year. We we're talking about um, you know, funding large transportation projects or economic development projects. And you know, this talks about not only the community mitigation fund, but the gaming economic development fund. And we had talked about last year about going out and doing kind of a solicitation with folks for kind of multi-year projects and things like that. And you know, quite frankly, due to the COVID and all that, that just simply didn't happen. Um, and our thought is for this year, let's, let's try to not really reinvent the wheel for this year. Let's kind of keep status quo for this year. And then maybe, maybe that's a, uh, something to look at for, uh, for the, for the 2022 20, uh, fund rather than this year. Um, number eight, this had been talked about in the past, but we never really acted on it. Um, and this is, should the commission consider the creation of an emergency reserve within the community mitigation fund for unknown impacts that arise after February 1st, 2021? The idea here was, look, if something really came up, and I can't picture what that thing might be, but then again, I didn't picture a pandemic either. Um, so, you know, emergencies do arise. Um, saying that if we put, put aside maybe a small amount of money, that said, if look, if something came up after applications were in, and it would have to be something really of kind of an emergency nature, that someone could come in and ask for community mitigation funds uh, for that impact. And we're talking about maybe putting aside a couple hundred thousand dollars and that it would expire each year if it wasn't used. This would be similar to um, the, uh, the money that we put aside, we put aside every year for uh, Region C, you know, if we always put a couple hundred thousand aside uh, in case the tribal casino gets up and rolling, this is that same idea. And I think it's, you know, again, it, in a previous program that I was in, we did have an emergency set aside and um, it was almost never used, but it was used in a couple of occasions. Um, and it was really important to those communities. So to me, it, it's, in my mind, it's sort of a little bit of no harm, no foul. It's a small amount of money um, that could be put aside and the likelihood of it being used is probably pretty small. Um, under number nine, this is uh, dealing with, uh, you know, we, we allowed public safety operational costs as part of the guidelines in 2020 and the question whether we should continue to do that. Um, so we did, have, we did struggle with this a little bit. Um, we did have four applications for public safety operational funding and two of them were approved. Uh, one of them was approved with a reduced level of funding and one of them was denied. Uh, the one that was denied was um, actually the, the city of Springfield Fire Department has a, uh, a, a they call it a TAC unit um, that's only operational one shift a day and they wanted to increase that to uh, three shifts a day, and that was really determined that that should have been included or was included in their host community agreement, um, and that we really couldn't fund that. Um, so uh, again, just that question of whether or not we should continue to do that. Uh, number 10, um, we are starting to get uh, some of these look back studies, traffic studies, and other things, and we do have our own research agenda. And this question was, how should, should we use those in making our determinations? And I think you know, the, the answer is we should certainly be using those in 
our evaluations of applications from our licensees. Uh, Region C, uh, Tribal Casino, um, nothing has really changed in the last year. I think, you know, we've put aside those $200,000 um, each year and it just rolls back into the fund if it isn't used. And I think we're recommending to do the same thing again. So this item 12, uh, we ask this every year and should the commission require a dollar for dollar match for its community mitigation fund grants? And this is just a listing of what we do require. And we already talked about that transportation construction grants that we discussed in number six above. Um, but some of these other ones, you know, again, we are finding that uh, in some of these applications that the impact that they're addressing is, it's not really well defined. And these, a lot of these things seem to be more uh, just beneficial to the community at large rather than um, addressing a casino impact. Um, so we did end up denying a few applications this year that were sort of in that category. Um, so the, part of this question really is, is if we require a match, you know, like a dollar, dollar, dollar for dollar match, um, the community has some skin in the game and they can sort of have part of this grant go towards their, really their local community general and then part towards addressing a, a, a casino impact. Um, so I guess think about that one a little bit on, um, and obviously if you start requiring a dollar for dollar match, we will probably have a reduced level of applications. Um, you know, the more money that's required from the community, the, the fewer applications we would probably get. So we'd really love you to think about that and sort of opine on, on your thoughts on that, especially with uh, many of you being, uh, you know, working for communities. Um, so if you all remember, we back at the beginning of this program, we gave reserves out to uh, each of the hosts and surrounding, uh, the surrounding communities um, to try to uh, plan for the opening of the casinos. And now you'll just see in the discussion, a bunch of them have used their entire reserve, but we still have a bunch that are sitting out there who've never touched their reserve or have only used a portion of it. Um, you know, this money was appropriated five, five years ago, Bruce, was it? Yeah, you know, so our thought is that, you know, we can't just let this money hang out there forever. And I think at least my thought was for in this round, tell the communities, maybe you have one more year to, to, to find a, a study or something to do to use that money, or you'll, you know, we, we're, I think we're getting down to a use it or lose it kind of situation. Maybe, I don't know what the right time is. Maybe it's a year. Uh, Maybe it's two years. I don't. I don't know. I just. Um, so, anyways, think about that a little bit. Joe. Yes. If you could uh, maybe let the communities, maybe uh, they're not aware that they, these reserves are sitting there, where they maybe they've changed administrations and not know they're available. If you can make us aware, um, what communities have not uh, applied their reserves before they run out. Oh yeah, yeah, Rick. So my plan is is for actually for this fall, um, you know, starting in October. You know, again, since I'm sort of taking over this program, what I want to do is actually, well, I want to meet with every community that we have grants with or reserves with, or even communities that we don't have anything with, um, and go over what they do have, because there have been, and this drives Mary uh, insane, uh, where, you know, we have staff turnover and we have new administrations and new appointees and all sorts of things. And, and it certainly is, a a distinct possibility that there are communities out there that have no idea that they have these reserves. Thank you. Um, uh, okay, so non-transportation related planning. Um, I think, you know, we, we provided those grants for those communities who had used all their reserves to, to do some uh, more planning to try to take advantage of the casinos and so on. And I think, um, we're not proposing to make any uh, radical changes to that, but these were the ones that we were having a little hard time. Uh, people were, uh, some of the communities seemed to be trying to do something that was for local benefit, but trying to get a tag into the casino that, and some of them just simply didn't work that well. Um, 
And let's see, okay. Uh, administrative costs, again, we don't allow administrative costs uh, in any of our applications except for the workforce programs where we do allow uh, seven and a half percent of the total grant to go towards uh, administrative costs. Uh, we weren't proposing any changes to that. Uh, under 16, it's the grants involving private parties. Uh, in the past, we had some issues with uh, uh, cities trying to uh, get money to private parties and they ran afoul of the anti-aid amendments of the constitution and so on. Um, and we really kind of ratcheted down on that uh, in our 2020 guidelines and we're not really proposing any changes there. Um, joint applications, um, we are, we have been and continue to encourage joint applications. And I think we would love to see, you know, multiple communities get together, especially on some of these uh, grants that we've given out where, uh, you know, for tourism purposes and other things, rather than one community trying to do something for tourism purposes, we'd love to see two or three or four communities get together and sort of do a more regional approach rather than um, this sort of, you know, we, all, we always talk about our 351 fiercely independent cities and towns, uh, but we'd love to have communities work together and, and try to um, do that. So we do have um, uh, incentives for that that we've already developed um, to try to encourage that. Uh, number 18, should communities be limited to one specific impact grant? We have done that, that is waivable. Um, we have waived that in the past, um, but we're not proposing a change to that. So under number 19, um, the Hamden County Sheriff's Office, we provided them back in 2016. They were in the footprint of where the MGM Casino stands today. And there is their Western Massachusetts Correctional Alcohol Center was there and they had to move to a new building. And of course their lease went way up and we agreed to provide 2 million in lease assistance over five years. So they had to come back each year for an application for 400,000. Well, this year marked the fifth year <clears throat> at our meeting with the sheriff's office after we finished our regular discussion, they broached the subject of uh, providing this assistance going forward. Now there's nothing that would prevent the sheriff's department from applying for a community mitigation fund application regardless. They're, they're eligible, they're a, you know, a state agency, they were impacted by the casino. Um, but you know, this is one of those things that, that I think the, the, uh, the commission ultimately needs to decide whether or not this is appropriate to continue to, to give them money in, as it relates to this. Um, I think we would certainly require um, a lot of backup documentation to demonstrate that it's still warranted. Um, but part of the thing is right now in the Western region, um, you know, they haven't been spending all of the money that's been allotted to them. So there is money available um, in that region. So I think this is going to be more of a question for region B, but we certainly would, would welcome your um, region A's um, input into that. Uh, number 20, we have a few grants out there that have not expended any money yet. Um, and, you know, of course, those sitting out there, and a couple of them look like they, they may never end up spending money. We gave grants to Everett and Somerville to design a connection to the uh, Assembly Row head house in an expectation of a bridge across the Mystic River. Um, you know, given the circumstances today with COVID and everything else, um, I'm not sure that we're going to see a bridge over the Mystic River at any time soon. So we don't really feel uh, like we want to spend that money to design a connection to a head house that might never be built. Um, so the notion there is, and there are a couple of other grants that have been sitting around for a few years where we haven't expended money on them. I think we need to either well, firstly, we need to talk to those communities and find out if they intend to spend the money on that, and if so, when. Um, but I think after sort of beating the bushes a little bit, we have to get to a point where we just don't want money tied up that's not going to be spent and that could 
increased capacity for either of the regions or for bigger projects or things of that nature. And Joe, similar to what the other one, uh, again, maybe these communities don't know they have the grants with it, with changes of administration, changes of, 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 of personnel. So Absolutely, if, and again, that's that's part that. of my that's part of my topics of discussion for for this fall with all of our communities. Um, and this this one here, uh, should communities be allowed to apply uh, to more than one category of grant for the same project? Uh, and John, this goes to you, and you were very clever this year in your application. Um, uh, this was the the Williams and Beecham Street corridor where. Uh, Chelsea did apply for money under the construction uh, grant and also applied for a specific impact grant. I don't think the, the, the commission ever thought that that would be the case. And I think my recommendation here is really to, to I think, have projects apply under a single category. Every one of our dollar values is waivable. And if a project really, um, is worthy to have that waived the community can make that argument and in this case we did give the grant under both categories because what we probably could have done we could have given it all under construction and waived the limit or but we just gave it under the two categories because it was a really great project it was um you know it was really a relatively small amount of money compared to the overall project costs um you know chelsea did a great job they did their own traffic study to demonstrate the impacts i mean it was really you know, John, you guys did a, a fabulous job on on that um, on that uh, project, which is obviously why we we granted all of the money on that. And and really, that was exactly what we envisioned for those uh, construction projects that, um, on how they how they would work. So, but my my thought is that that seemed to be kind of a loophole that maybe we should maybe we should close. Um, and then uh, under item 22, these are all just the, the things that we use to evaluate the grants and we're not really proposing to change any of those. I don't think we need to go through them. Um, so with that, you know, so that is a quick overview of um, what our policy uh, discussion is. And, and you don't need to feel compelled to opine today, but I think at our next meeting, which is Mary early October, um, I'd love to get all of your input at that meeting. So if you can spend some time between now and the next meeting, you know, reviewing these and, and preparing some uh, comments, or if you do have comments today, be happy to listen to them. Do we have any, <clears throat> do we have any questions for, for Joe? Joe, so can I so this is run over with the city of Malden. Can I make a suggestion? What, what might be helpful <clears throat> is between now and the next meeting, that, that a, a revised uh, document is sent out that we can type comments into and maybe share it back with you all so that you've had the, the chance to pull those together. And, you know, prior to when we meet again next time, I think it might work better than, you know, than, than starting from scratch at the next meeting. I know I prefer to have the time to be able to sit down, type in comments, send it back, and to the extent that anybody else feels the same way. Yeah, I think that'd be great. Uh, that would that would be very helpful. Um, so, Mary, is there a? Um, let me just I'll just jump out of this document. Mary, is there? Um, can you send them an? Uh, I guess a word, probably just a word copy or of the document so that they can mark it up. All right. Well, yeah, we'll make sure that we'll make sure that that gets out to you. Um, and this is my. I have a couple of comments on the sure. presentation. Yeah. Number one is it is a question for the commissioner. And when we were talking about conversations with the partners on training, there has been a conversations on a high set or the high school diploma requirement with partners. Sorry about that, Mayra. How are you? Good, good, and you? Good. Um, I mean, base, uh, the two workforce applications, I'll just start with what we did in 2020. The two workforce applications, I think, continue to both focus on adult basic ed and some GED oh. programs is applied to by the Metro North Regional Employment Board and um, 
the uh, Holyoke Community College was the entity out in Western Mass. Uh, what we did not take action on was the balance of the application, which was on gaming or specific to our gaming establishment skills training. So that could have been culinary or the gaming school or something that was specific to somebody who might be hired at MGM and Encore. But I think we all realize that continuing the, the support for the ABE programs or the GED programs continue to help position um, those job candidates uh, to complete some education and training to put them in a position to apply for a job when it comes back. But we didn't want to stop that kind of dead in its tracks. We thought we were seeing some success with the programs that we were supporting. Okay, so my experience and more after co or during COVID-19 is has been that we have seen an increase of participant in the high set program. So which is the, the high school equivalent. When mm -hmm. we have a program with Bunker Hill Community College and we have seen that definitely has been a, a lot of demand. So what I okay. think is the, the, the participants and seeing so I'm not working right now have been laid off. So let me, let me take this opportunity to go back to, to the path and uh, doing the high school diploma or the high set and also continue with the education. So thank you so much sure. for that. And then the other piece is related to the construction. And I know the target amount of the grant, it was 1 million. But Joe, you stated that we have received more uh, grants and we have dispersed more. So maybe we think about, you know, what was the target versus the actual and might increase that uh, amount. So that's one. And then the, the last one is on the workforce on the administrative uh, cost allowance, which is 7.5%. My experience that has, that has increased significantly and even to 15%, so double of what we are allowing right now, just a thought. Yeah, I think... Um, I think Jill and Crystal had done um, an evaluation of what sort of some of those typical costs were, and they were finding them at sort of between five and ten percent. So we just kind of kind of cut it down the middle. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> okay. So that's my comment for now. So, Thank so you. there wasn't there wasn't a real super high tech uh, analysis of that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Marla. you. Yeah. Any more questions for Joe? All right, thank you. Thank you, Joe. Okay, next, uh, use of the community mitigation fund for, uh, for administ administration purposes. Um, Chief Financial Officer Derek Lennon is here to give us an overview. Derek. And, and just, before, just before Derek jumps in, I would just like to uh, add in. So um, Mary and I, I'm just gonna mute myself. I'll listen in, but Mary and I can't really be involved in this discussion because this has a potential to affect um, our salaries. So um, with that, I'm going to leave it to Derek. And I think Todd's also here on sort of the legal side of things. Thank you, All right, Take it away, Derek. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank you for having me here. Uh, always, always nice to see new faces. I used to do some of these grants. Um, I've gotten out of that role for the last two years, but um, seemed like these Groups have done nothing but get better, and the applications have done nothing but get better. Um, projects are getting bigger as well, and with that comes the idea of uh, managing this grant portfolio. Um, as Joe pointed out, the dollar amounts continue to increase now that we have tax dollars flowing in, and we really don't have fully dedicated staff. Um, now, I used to work at the Office of Grants and Research at Public Safety, where um, we took in hundreds of millions of dollars in federal money and I was at Housing and Economic Development where we gave out um, all of the um, transportation grants, economic development grants, public works grants, um, took over a big, big portfolio of those from MassDOT. And with most grant programs, it comes an administrative um, pot of money. With this one, we haven't taken any because the tax dollars haven't been flowing in. I put a proposal into the budget this year um, to start using some of it and 
the commission wanted us to go out and draft some regs um, on the overall program to formalize one, just the process that has kind of grown, and then two, have a public process where people can do input into what the right amount of um, of administrative funds would be for this for this program. Um, as you can see, we have Joe Delaney working maybe 50% of the time on, on this grant. Um, Mary spends about 75% of her time. We have just brought Tanya on to help out with this. Um, but you haven't seen any site visits from them. Part of the part of the process for grant administration is getting out and doing subrecipient monitoring. You do an excellent job submitting invoice um, reports to us. Uh, Mary goes through those with me before we send out the next installment of money. But you know, there are some areas that we could really do better at making sure that this money is spent in the best possible way, as well as when there's leftover money, finding a use to get it back into your hands. Um, and that's something that we're we're trying to work through with the regs too. So off timing requests, uh, amendments to them, how to get those done when when the um, grant cycle doesn't doesn't go perfectly. Um, so the intent is to probably get anywhere like Joe was talking before between five and 10%, um, which is standard with most grant programs of what the funding will be. Has to be a lot of discussion. I know the commissioners talked to me about how to break it up between region A and region B as the pots of money for grants go get distributed between region A and region B. So any input you can provide us ahead of time, uh, your thought processes, would be greatly appreciated because it helps to shape the regs that the um, legal team is drafting and to have a discussion around that. Thank you, uh, Derek. Uh, do we have any questions for Derek? Who does the work now? So right now, Mary um, does a lot of it. Joe does a lot of it. Um, my, my grant, my, um, Budget director who just left does a lot of it. Um, I'm pitching in when Mary and Joe have issues. Crystal does a lot of it, um, working, but she's working on another set of state grants at the same time, um, funded by the, by the casinos. Jill does a lot of it. So we don't really have dedicated resources. We're trying to tap into like five, ten percent of everyone um, to not overstress it. And we're at the we're at the point right now where the program has really grown and the dollars coming out will warrant some dedicated resources to pay attention to it. Some of the things Joe brought up, grants that haven't been used in three to four years, being able to check in with the licensees, get real timelines on what's going to happen, not having that going between five, six different people and <laughs> trying to track it down when you're looking at the whole portfolio. Um, so that's really the the impetus of this. We've been talking about it at our compl internal compliance working groups. This is one of the areas that we think that we really need to strengthen our oversight, strengthen our um, our just understanding of what's going on with each program and having some dedicated funding would would be helpful. And I think it I think it helps to protect the resources in the long run so that state auditors have as comes through, everything is perfect um, as it can be. You know, they'll always find something, but as it can be, and it's not, well, you know, we're trying to make it work as best we can. So, so uh, Rick, can I um, just, just run with the city of Auburn? So, so Derek, I, I mean, I certainly don't feel like it's an unreasonable request. My, my feeling on these types of things is that in, instead of it being top down, a percentage five or ten percent i always feel like it should be bottoms up which is a proposal to say we feel like if we had the following resources to support administering the grants that it would be a, a responsible way to go about it and then we look at where that lands and feel you know uh, or every, some of the right folks look at it and decide if it leaves um, you know sort of leaves us in a responsible place from that perspective but i, I never like just saying let's allocate five or ten percent to administrative costs because it's random right i mean as the grant gets bigger, your 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 administrative costs as a percentage of the grant should go down, right? I mean, that's just the way that these things should work. So, you know, I don't know if you if the proposal is going to is going to entail a proposal to to add X number of folks to be able to handle the grant, so that as you said, you're not pulling a little bit from you know a handful of people, but but I would think that that would be a better way to do it, so that it's it's fairly black and white and not just a throw a number at it and then 
you know, it just it finds a way to get spent. So that's just my input. So, so that's actually where we started off by um, shifting some resources off and then going to the commission on a budget. That's a, that's a good point of view, um, and we'll definitely take that back for for discussion with Todd and the legal group. Um, but this is the type of comments we need, and you know, are seeking from the bigger group um, because the commission we can make it that the commission approves an administrative budget. And it's not to exceed a certain amount every year, um, you know, and and that's one way to make sure that. What you're talking about is really scrutinized numbers, and there's a there's a really good justification as to why we're doing it, rather than because we can spend 10%. So I understand what you're talking about. I've been from the federal world where sometimes you're sitting there trying to figure out how to spend that money so it doesn't go away. Derek, I um I would agree with Ron, but also just to add that I I think it's uh, appropriate and the norm to get some administrative money out of this budget now. And I think we should we should be going down that path, but uh, again, probably through a budgeting process, maybe with an annual review of what that budget already is. But I certainly think it's uh, there should be some money allocated for administrative expenses. Thank, Thank you. you. Any any more questions for Derek? Okay, Derek. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, next up, uh, update on the 2020 awards. Okay, um, so we did, uh, you know, again, we, I talked about them a little bit earlier. Um, what we ended up having was we, you know, we had uh, proposed $11.5 million for last year and, and we only uh, budgeted, I mean, I should say we only awarded uh, about 6.7. Let me just share this. Um, this is just a spreadsheet that Mary had all together, um, just showing what our grants were for the last for the last year. Okay, so um, this doesn't quite fit on the screen terribly well, but you'll see here we had budgeted um, six million dollars for for the east. Okay, and we actually awarded 3.9 million in the east. So uh, rolling over a little bit more than 2 million into the next year. Um, and we had budgeted 5 million for the west, awarded about 2.7 million. Uh, so that again, a, a fairly a good amount that rolls over. Now we do have the, the category two and the, and, and, and the um, tribal, we have to allocate those to east and west, but as you can see that the total amount of 6.873 uh, is what was awarded for this year. So, um, you know, and again, those reasons why we wound up with the reduced amount, you know, part of it was due to, due to COVID, those workforce planning ones we reduced. Um, you know, again, we determined there were a couple that were not eligible. City of Springfield, I think, was asking for four hundred thousand dollars for the fire department there, and that was not funded at all. Um, you know, and there were a number of others that we uh, that the transportation construction projects that we talked about um, that that we ended up not funding the ones that a couple of them that proposed you know zero percent matching funds and that kind of thing. So. Um, that's essentially where we are, which means that we do have a fair amount of rollover that we can roll over into this year. So I guess with that, um, I'll open it up to any questions that anyone might have on the 2020. Do we have any questions for Joe? No, I guess so. Yeah, I guess uh, uh, no questions. Uh, thank okay. You for that one. Uh, next steps. So just just for the for the next meeting, I think primarily what we want to actually out in the in the western region, they had asked me to do a little presentation on, you know, what what the status was due to COVID, you know, what our revenues were before, what they've been after, what employment was before and after, and I think that certainly makes a lot of sense to to do a, a quick report on that. So I will plan on um, doing that at the next meeting. But I think the, the key thing for the next meeting is if you can look at those policy questions 
and sort of opine on, um, you know, on what your thoughts are on them, you know, on, on what way we should go, because the, the commission will certainly take those under advisement in their decisions on what the final guidelines end up looking like. Um, and Mary, is there anything that I'm forgetting that we should talk about at the next meeting? Yes, in fact, a very important thing. Well, this is for not next steps. This is other business. Can I? So the, at the next meeting, we anticipate holding the vote for the chair for this committee and for the member representing the subcommittee for community mitigation. So we'd love to hear from members who would like to be in these positions. Um, I think, uh, Rick, have you found it to be an onerous task or? Uh, no, I'll only stay, Mary, if, uh, if, we, if we get a, a raise in uh, pay. I think Ron will say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> we'll do, if we can double our salary from last year. Okay. I think, <laughs> I, I, I think we can it. do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, I, I have no problem continuing on, Mary, if, if that's, if that's if the, what the committee wants. Okay, so that'll be at the next meeting. We will have that as one of the first items. Start okay, campaigning Ron. now, Rick. Sorry? <laughs> Start campaigning now. It will. <laughs> and Ron, I think you, you were the representative to the subcommittee, is that correct? That's correct. You still interested in that? Um, I'm happy to continue if that's the desire of the group, and I'll step aside the moment anybody else has any interest. So uh, I'll do whatever, whatever works. Great. I'll take half of Rick's raise. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Any um, any other any other business before we adjourn? Um, I just wanted to say so. The next meeting is October fourteenth at one thirty to three. The same format as today. Okay. We have a motion Mary, to adjourn? Well, just Mary, you'll send out that document for us to make notes on. Yeah, Mary, I think you, you were having some technical difficulties there. I don't know if I you was. heard. So the, the, the policy document, the policy questions, we were hoping you could send that out um, okay. in a form that they can mark up. Oh, sure. Okay. Yep. You know, so just so that we can, if, if everybody can, you know, type in their comments, that might be easier to, to digest. Okay. Great. Okay. I make a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn by John Supreme. Second that. Second. 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 Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank Aye. you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Uh, Joe, Thank you. Thank you. Second.